This is Nova Scotia, only slightly larger than the state of Hawaii and with a thick history of European colonialism. It has quite a lot to teach us about the history of North America and the formation of Canada. From how it was the first place in North America European settlers used for resource extraction to how it was fought over by various colonial powers for over a century and even how it became the location of the largest accidental man-made explosion in history. This is Understanding Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia covers an area of approximately 55,284 square kilometers. That is 21,345 square miles. It ranks as one of the smaller provinces in Canada in terms of land mass, roughly the size of the state of Maine in the United States. But it also ranks fifth in terms of population density amongst Canada's 10 provinces. With 17.5 people per square kilometer, it is significantly more dense than the national average of 4.05 people per square kilometer. Nova Scotia's population is concentrated primarily along the coast, particularly in the areas like Halifax and the Annapolis Valley. This concentration creates pockets of high density, even though the overall landmass is relatively large and sparse. The Annapolis Valley, often referred to as the Garden of Nova Scotia, is renowned for its fertile soil and agricultural abundance, producing apples, grapes and a variety of other crops. Historic harbours like Lunenburg, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, showcases seafaring heritage with colourful waterfronts, preserved 18th century architecture and a vibrant fishing culture. As the capital and largest city, Halifax is the economic and cultural heart. Nestled along the Atlantic Ocean, it boasts a historic waterfront, vibrant art scene, and a dynamic business environment. Mi'kmaq, the First Nations people of Nova Scotia, hold a special place in the province's history and culture. We will begin our discovery of how Nova Scotia became what it is today by learning a little bit about them. For several thousand years, the territory of the province has been a part of the territory of the Mi'kmaq, and their territories encompass the majority of Canada's eastern coast, including Newfoundland. The geography of these regions wasn't very conductive to farming due to their harsh climate. This led the Mi'kmaq to adopt a semi-nomadic lifestyle, subsisting mainly on fishing and hunting. Their life cycle revolved around moving between two different habitats the interior winter camps and the larger coastal communities during the summer season. The harsh winter weather made it difficult to survive in the open coastal areas. To cope, they would move inland where they could find shelter from the extreme cold. The pre-contact population is estimated between 3,000 and 30,000 individuals, but soon to arrive Europeans caused a massive decline bringing smallpox and other endemic European infectious diseases, to which the Mi'kmaq had no immunity. Then wars and alcoholism led to a further decline. A Venetian, known in English as John Cabot, was the first European explorer of the North American continent, after the Vikings that is. His voyage in 1497 ushered in an irrevocable transformation of global social and economic interaction between the continents. Upon landing either somewhere in Nova Scotia or Newfoundland, Cabot raised the Venetian and papal banners, claiming the land for the King of England and recognizing the religious authority of the Roman Catholic Church. As a result, Mi'kmaq territory was the first portion of North America that Europeans exploited at length for resources. As soon enough, early European fishermen started showing up. They salted their catch at sea and sailed directly home with it. Camps were set up ashore as early as 1520 for dry curing cod. Trade between the Mi'kmaq and the fishermen would have begun roughly around the same time. By 1578, some 350 European ships were operating around the St. Lawrence estuary. Most were independent fishermen, but increasing numbers were exploring the fur trade. Interestingly, on June 24, 1610, Mi'kmaq Grand Chief, Mamberto, converted to Catholicism and was baptized. 
A treaty was signed with the Pope protecting French settlers and priests and affirmed the rights of the Mi'kmaq to choose either Catholicism or their tradition. Also in signing the treaty, the Catholic Church affirmed the Mi'kmaq sovereignty as a Catholic nation. In the year 1605, a group of French settlers established the first enduring European settlement, Acadia, from the Greek word, which represents idyllic simplicity and peacefulness. But while Nova Scotia was relatively peaceful, Europe certainly wasn't. The Thirty Years' War is noted for being one of the most destructive and long-lasting and has been the subject of debate amongst historians. Some argue its roots were steeped in religious tension, primarily between Protestants and Catholics. Others contend it was a power struggle between the Habsburg dynasty, ruling Spain and Austria, and the French House of Bourbon. This era of upheaval had profound implications not just for Europe, but also for the New World. The British, ever eager to expand their territories and influence, saw this as an opportune time to seize French lands in the Americas. As part of these grand ambitions, King James issued a charter to establish the colony of Nova Scotia. This was a significant move in the larger Anglo-French conflict, as it marked a direct attempt by the British to stake a claim on French territories. And so, in the year 1621, France was forced to cede control of Port Royal and Acadia. Consequently, the capital of Nova Scotia was established at Charles Fort, a strategic location near the present-day town of Annapolis Royal. However, the British hold on the colony was short-lived, lasting only until 1623. At that point, the settlers abandoned their efforts due to the harsh local climate, inadequate supplies and poor relations with the indigenous population, and the region reverted to French control. For the next two centuries, the history of Nova Scotia was mostly dominated by proxy conflict between various colonial powers, all of whom were trying to establish a foothold in the region and one-up each other. One of the most important of these conflicts was the War of Spanish Succession, which spanned from 1701 to 1714 was a monumental conflict that involved a multitude of major European powers, including Britain, France, Spain and Austria. The war was set into motion by the death of Charles II of Spain, who surprisingly gave his entire estate to Philip, Duke of Anjou. Philip was part of the French Bourbon family, which raised the potential for a dangerous unification of France and Spain under the Bourbon monarchy. Such an alliance unsettled other European nations. In response, Britain, along with Austria, the Dutch Republic and other states banded together to form a grand coalition. The war was widespread, with main theatres in Spain and the Low Countries. However, the conflict also spread to Italy, Germany and Portugal. Across the Atlantic in North America, this war is known as Queen Anne's War, the second of the four French and Indian Wars. It pitted the British colonial forces, along with their Native American allies, against the French and their corresponding Native allies. The war zones of this conflict were the territories of New England and the Canadian region, with significant battles taking place in Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. Great Britain emerged as the primary benefactory of the war. France conceded British claims to strategic areas like the Hudson Bay region, Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. However, the treaty left certain issues hanging in the balance, particularly the fates of the French-speaking Acadian population. In an effort to strengthen their hold, the British authorities made numerous attempts to populate Nova Scotia with British settlers. However, these attempts were largely met with failure, as the hostility of the environment and the resistance from the Acadians and their indigenous allies made settlement difficult and unsustainable. So in order to solve this problem, the British began the Great Expulsion of 1755. Out of an estimated 14,100 Acadians, approximately 11,500 were forcibly removed this drastically altered the demographic landscape of Nova Scotia, significantly reducing the Acadian population. At least 5,000 Acadians died of disease, starvation or shipwrecks. 
their houses were burned, and their land given to settlers, loyal to Britain, mostly immigrants from New England and Scotland. The event is largely regarded as a crime against humanity, though modern-day application of the term genocide is debated. The foundation of Halifax can be traced back to 1749 as a part of British consolidation over Nova Scotia. Halifax was strategically positioned on the eastern coast, providing easy access to the Atlantic Ocean, an ideal base for British naval operations, ensuring control over vital trade routes. The Mi'kmaq, named for Halifax, is Chebuktuk, meaning Great Harbour. The British government actively encouraged immigration to Halifax attracting settlers with the promise of land grants and economic opportunities. This influx of settlers from England, Scotland and other parts of Europe resulted in a diverse and multicultural society that shaped the future of Nova Scotia. Halifax quickly became a hub of economic activity, with the growth of industries such as fishing, shipbuilding and trade. The city's strategic importance continued to grow, especially during the American Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. Halifax served as a key naval base and a refuge for British loyalists fleeing the conflict in the American colonies. The 1760s heralded a drastic shift in the demographics of the Scottish Highlands with the onset of the Fudach Nan Gadeel, or the Highland Clearances. The clearances, primarily driven by economic changes, resulted in a mass exodus of Highlanders who were evicted from their homelands to make way for large-scale sheep farming. In the wake of this upheaval, many Scottish immigrants found solace in Nova Scotia. They were drawn to the promise of a better life and the chance to own and cultivate their own land. As in 1784, Scottish settlement was further facilitated by the repeal of a law that had previously restricted land ownership on Cape Breton Island. This change in legislation opened the floodgates for Scottish immigrants to establish permanent residence and form close-knit communities. The inflow of Gaelic-speaking settlers significantly altered the cultural and linguistic landscape. They infused their new homes with Scottish and Gaelic traditions and music, dance and storytelling, which eventually all became integral to Nova Scotia's cultural identity. Between 1815 and 1870, it is estimated that more than 50,000 Gaelic settlers migrated to Nova Scotia. The legacy of these immigrants is evident in the names of numerous towns, landmarks and streets throughout Nova Scotia and Cape Breton. Scottish surnames are widespread, and though the Gaelic language has declined over the years, it continues to be cherished and preserved by dedicated communities. In 1775, when the American Revolution broke out, Many Nova Scotians, mainly those who were New England born, showed sympathies towards the American patriots. However, their support gradually declined due to the aggressive actions of American privateers, who launched attacks on Nova Scotian villages and shipping. So many who were previously neutral or sympathetic towards the patriots began to align themselves with the British. This shift in loyalties was further bolstered by the presence of British military units in the region and the local government's support for the British cause. As the war progressed, Nova Scotia became a haven for loyalists, those who remained faithful to the British crown, leading to a significant population boost. The colonial government of Nova Scotia actively supported the British war effort, recruiting soldiers, supplying provisions, the British Naval Squadron, stationed in Halifax, played a significant role in thwarting any American invasion and blocking their support for local rebels. Despite these efforts, the Royal Navy struggled to maintain its dominance at sea, as many American privateers continued their attacks on British shipping until the final months of the war, making it difficult for the Royal Navy to secure its supply lines against American and French attacks. After the war, Nova Scotia saw a significant influx of loyalists seeking refuge, with an estimated 30,000 people, primarily from New York State, migrating northwards. This surge in population prompted the geographical division of Nova Scotia to accommodate the new settlers, leading to the establishment of New Brunswick and Cape Breton as separate colonies. 
Nova Scotia, like other British North American colonies, officially declared neutrality in the American Civil War. This decision was influenced by a desire to maintain peaceful relations with both the Union and the Confederacy. Still, over 200 Nova Scotians fought, with most joining Maine or Massachusetts infantry regiments, either adventure-seeking or looking for pay. The province's neutrality allowed it to engage in trade with both sides. The economic prosperity that resulted from this trade was driven by the demand for Nova Scotian goods, including timber, coal and fish. And Nova Scotia was well positioned to meet those needs. While officially neutral, Nova Scotia faced accusations of supporting the Confederacy, particularly through the practice of blockade running, which involved smuggling goods including arms and supplies, past the Union naval blockade to the Confederate States. Accusations of blockade running were often met with denials, emphasizing the official stance of neutrality. However, historical records suggest that some Nova Scotian entrepreneurs were indeed involved, driven by the potentially lucrative profits associated with supplying goods to the Confederacy. In the mid-19th century, Britain, came up with a plan to bolster Nova Scotia's defences. The strategy was to entrust the defence of Nova Scotia to a united Canadian government, thus forming a stronger and more cohesive front, particularly from the United States. This move, however, was met with mixed reactions, and for a moment it appeared that Nova Scotia might opt for isolation rather than integration. However, the decisive power ultimately lay in London. It was here where the fate of Nova Scotia was sealed, and it was decided to proceed with the union of the provinces into what would become the Dominion of Canada. After three momentous constitutional conferences, the British North America Act was passed in 1867, marking the birth of the Canadian Confederation, initially consisting of Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Following this, Canada assumed control of Rupert's Land and the North Western Territory, merging the two regions to form the Northwest Territories. In 1871, British Columbia and Vancouver Island decided to join the Canadian Confederation also, spurred by the promise of a transcontinental railway reaching Victoria within 10 years. Prince Edward Island followed suit in 1873. And so in the span of a few decades, Nova Scotia transitioned from an isolated colony to an integral part of a growing and dynamic Canadian Confederation. During the second half of the 19th century, Nova Scotia ascended to a global prominence in the construction and ownership of wooden sailing vessels, forging a reputation as a dominant maritime presence. This period bore witness to the emergence of highly skilled shipbuilders and designers, whose craftsmanship was recognized internationally. Perhaps the most distinguished seafarer to emerge from Nova Scotia during this period was Joshua Slocum. In 1895, he became the first person to circumnavigate the globe single-handedly. However, the advent of steamships signaled the end of the golden age of sail. Despite this, the legacy of this era lived on, inspiring future generations of mariners and captivating the public's imagination. Following Nova Scotia's entry into the Confederation, the residents of Halifax held expectations that the federal government would bolster the city's natural harbour, transforming it into Canada's official winter port and a key link to European trade. However, the construction of the new intercontinental railway took a more indirect route due to military and political considerations. Furthermore, the national government showed little interest in promoting Halifax as Canada's winter port. As a result, most Canadian exporters chose to send their goods through Boston or Portland. The lack of a large-scale port facility in Halifax and the absence of financial backing for such initiatives further compounded the issue. The situation persisted until the outbreak of the First World War. During World War I, Halifax underwent a transformative evolution. The city morphed into a bustling hub for war-related activities, becoming a critical shipment point for war supplies. Troop ships traveling to Europe from Canada and the United States and hospital ships bringing back the wounded, causing a boom in population and economic activity. 
Halifax became a sanctuary for various military installations, including naval bases and training facilities, with an increased military presence that drove the development of infrastructure and support services. Local industries were rallied to aid in production of war materials, from munitions to ships. Halifax factories and workshops became pivotal in supporting the war machinery and meeting military demands. But the city didn't exactly survive the war unscathed. On the fateful morning of December 6, 1917, the French cargo ship SS Montblanc, laden with high explosives, collided with the Norwegian vessel SS Imo. The collision sparked a fire, causing the Mont Blanc to explode, laying waste to the Richmond district of Halifax. The calamity claimed the lives of at least 1,782 people, with 9,000 others injured. The resulting explosion is still considered to be the largest accidental explosion in human history, releasing energy equivalent to roughly 2.9 kilotons of TNT. Nearly all structures within a 800-meter radius were obliterated. A tsunami created by the blast wiped out the community of the Mi'kmaq in the Tuft Cove area. Several memorials in the north end of Halifax serve as constant reminders of the tragic event. Following the end of World War I, Nova Scotia grappled with significant economic challenges, as rural areas witnessed a steady decline in population. Compounded by the Great Depression, which began in 1929, which further exacerbated the province's economic struggles, as demand for coal, steel, fish and lumber plummeted. Despite these struggles, Halifax once again became a critical staging point for convoys to Britain during World War II. German U-boats in the North Atlantic posed a threat, leading to Halifax becoming the headquarters for the Halifax Escort Force, composed of Canadian and British warships. The city's population once again swelled. Industrial sectors, particularly shipbuilding and manufacturing, experienced a resurgence. Necessary precautions against potential Axis air raids by implementing civilian defense efforts and air raid drills. Women joined the workforce in large numbers, contributing to industries supporting the war effort. However, a chilling reminder of the 1917 tragedy occurred in 1945 when another explosion occurred at a naval munitions storage facility. Luckily, due to the lessons learned from the past, Halifax had emergency plans in place, leading to an orderly and widespread evacuation. As a result, the damage was significantly less than the 1917 incident, with only minor injuries reported. When World War II ended, Halifax faced another repeated challenge of transitioning back to peacetime activities, with wartime industries scaling down while new opportunities emerged for reconstruction and economic diversification. One significant shift in the post-war economy was the rise of the services sector, encompassing healthcare, education and tourism. These industries became cornerstones of Nova Scotia's economy, replacing the previous reliance on traditional industries. This transition played a pivotal role in the region's economic resilience. Halifax underwent extensive urban renewal projects, replacing aging structures with modern, efficient buildings. Infrastructure development was a key aspect, with the construction of highways, bridges and public buildings aimed at accommodating the growing population. A notable project was the construction of the Angus L. Macdonald Bridge in 1955, providing a link between Halifax and Dartmouth. This bridge significantly enhanced intercity connectivity. During this period, Halifax experienced rapid population growth due to rural urban migration and the post-war baby boom, and the growth of academic institutions such as Dalhouse University and the establishment of St. Mary's University, attracting a diverse range of students from around the world. However, not all sectors thrive. The fishing industry, which had been a cornerstone of Nova Scotia's economy since the 17th century, suffered a steep decline. Overfishing, particularly in the 1960s with the emergence of trawling, severely impacted the industry. The devastating collapse of the cod stocks in 1992 and subsequent closure of this sector resulted in the loss of approximately 20,000 jobs, underscoring the need for continued economic diversification. 
In the modern-day economy, emerging sectors like tourism and various service industries are rising in prominence, and Halifax is emerging as a significant economic powerhouse. It is home to various financial institutions, government offices, and a thriving startup scene, making it a vibrant center of economic activity. The province has experienced growth in fields such as information technology, telecommunications, and ocean technology. Companies operating in these sectors are leveraging Nova Scotia's strategic coastal location. Interestingly, Nova Scotia holds the title of the world's largest exporter of Christmas trees, lobster, gypsum, and wild berries. The province's fish export value exceeds $1 billion, reaching 90 countries across the globe. Nova Scotia's defense and aerospace sector generates around $500 million in revenue annually and also contributes approximately $1.5 billion to the provincial economy each year. Around 40% of Canada's military assets are housed in Nova Scotia. The CFB Halifax serves as the base for the Royal Canadian Navy's Atlantic Fleet. Emphasizing Nova Scotia's continued importance as a military port, a role it has played for over three centuries. Tourism in Nova Scotia is another rapidly growing sector with over 7,300 direct businesses, supporting nearly 48,000 jobs. This means that one in seven jobs in Nova Scotia is directly linked to tourism. The sector's contribution to the provincial GDP has increased exceeding 2.2 billion annually in 2023. While cruise ship tourism has experienced some ups and downs, Halifax and Sydney ports welcomed 136,000 and 47,000 passengers respectively in 2022. In August 2023, Nova Scotia set a new record by hosting 382,000 visitors, a 12% increase from the previous year, indicating a strong recovery from the pandemic. The future for Nova Scotia looks promising. With its rich wind and tidal resources, the province has the potential to become a leading producer and exporter of clean energy. Investments in sustainable fishing practices and innovative aquaculture technologies can ensure the long-term health of the ocean and create economic opportunities for Nova Scotia's coastal communities. This optimistic outlook indicates a bright future for Nova Scotia. Next, learn more about the history of Canada by checking out my video on Montreal. And this is my Patreon map. Everyone on this map is a legend. Thank you guys so much for the support.